This is the Besotted Pride of West London podcast. And we are coming to you when the sun looks like it's actually going to be coming out. We look like we might be going into spring. We've been struggling this year, it has to be said. It's been cold, it's been freezing. We've been freezing our nuts off, as they say. Other people have been freezing other things off, but it looks like we actually might be going into the period, which is the, it's the one when you sort of stand outside the pubs and the sun is shining and everyone's standing around and chatting away. And uh, it, it's that kind of sort of back end of the football season vibe, which we've been struggling to drag ourselves into. My name's Billy Grant. I'm sitting here in the virtual joint with my man Laney before our match against Aston Villa at the weekend. Laney, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I know what you mean about this kind of end of season weather thing. Just when the when the warmer warmer evenings come back and you can, as you say, stand outside the globe um, rather than tuck yourself indoors and uh, just just chat, it's more social, um, which uh, which a trip to Wolverhampton isn't. So um, yes, it was. Well, the sun came out a bit, didn't it, on, on Saturday? There was a few yeah. people outside that blue brick pub. Yeah. Um, enjoying enjoying the, the the race, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to Saturday. I'm looking forward to the running. Um, seven games to go, and uh, then we get a, a close season, and then a third season in the Prem. Yeah, indeed, that third season in the Prem, and, and it's interesting because you say you're looking forward to the match at the weekend. As you know, we picked up loads of fans from all over the world. And uh, the thing I'd like to see is that, I mean, we talked about our US tour and people are sitting down there sort of kind of sort of counting the pennies to see whether or not they can afford it and whether or not and where they're going to go. Are they going to do one match? Are they going to do two matches? Are they going to do three matches? Brentford are playing in the USA. They're playing up in Philadelphia. They're playing down in Atlanta and they're playing up in Washington. And like I said to you, and it's interesting as well, because I've been speaking to the uh, to the Villa boys as well, the Sutton Coalfield Villa, uh, Hatchet and them lot who are going to be down at the Globe on Saturday in their droves as they normally are. And uh, they're getting excited because they're going over to... Um, Obviously, they're going over to America for the USA tour. And they said to us, hey, if we don't see you at the Globe on Saturday, we'll see you for a beer in America, as you do. Like, you know, so it seems like it's not only us who are actually getting excited for the US tour. There are other fans getting excited as well. So, uh, like I said, it's obviously going to be quite tough for some people because it's not like it's going to be, you know, a a train ticket to Hull or something like that. It's going to be a little bit more expensive. Like, Like I said to you, it's nice to see that people are actually tucking in. But what I was saying is that also we have our American chums are coming over and towards the back end of the season it seems that quite a few of them have been saving up their pennies and are flying over for some games i know the start sarnecki um, from washington as well or the washington area he's flying in as well for the game at the weekend he's going to chelsea as well and i think he might be getting to the forest game as well he's tucking right in and we've got also katie katie J from the atlanta b who's going to be putting up loads of bees up in atlanta when the bees go there she's flying over in as well for i think for the chelsea game and also for no actually for the villa game at the weekend and also uh, she's going to ireland to do some fishing and then she's coming back to the chelsea game as well so like i said to you it's good to see that the people are tucking in they're putting their money where their mouth is as well um listen i mean we're talking about happy times and celebrating and summer you know but we've had a bit of sad news as well this week because there's a brentford legend who unfortunately passed away this week wasn't it laney yeah he's, he's uh an absolute uh uh griffin park icon um tony skeets um probably better known to a lot of people and would have would have heard him as well um, someone who was famous for getting behind the team with his anthemic push up Brentford, push up Brentford. He he was, would say that uh, repeatedly getting behind his team um, and uh, he, his voice and, and that term was kind of like, you know, synonymous with, with um, Brentford's uh, travels up and down the country. And uh, yeah, he's uh, unfortunately, um, his, his, his son shared the news on social media this week to say that that Tony had, had sadly passed away, um, and there goes another another terrace legend. Bill, um, you know, this 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 seems to be um, a fair a fair few that we've lost in 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 the, in the recent few years. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm just I'm glad, I guess, that uh, he saw us in the top flight, and uh, um, he would have he would have shared the euphoria of going up at Wembley and some of the highlights of the last couple of years. But ultimately. Um, gone but not forgotten, Bill. 100% uh, gone but not forgotten. I mean, the thing is, I say about him as well, you know, Mr. Push-Up Brentford, the, the, the really 
I say interesting thing about him is that I believe or I think that he is completely and utterly kind of linked and associated with Griffin Park with their old stadium so we were talking about our new fans and our new fans a lot of them are associated with the new stadium even though a few of them actually kind of you know um, got in in the olden days but don't forget we were in the championship then so we didn't necessarily have the television coverage in the states or wherever else like we do now so so for me he was associated with you know wherever i think he sat in the in the in the in the braemore road and and you know and he was associated with you know <laughs> Just what he used to say, and basically what he used to just say is he used to say, push up Brentford, push up Brentford, push up Brentford, push up Brentford. And that kind of became his catchphrase. And even Sav, who fairly recently did a video, if you go and check it out on YouTube and all other good channels, it's even on the TV as well. There's a documentary called Push Up Brentford, which was named after Mr. Push Up Brentford because of his infamous phrase that he said as well. And it's a really good documentary. Like I said to you, anyone who's new, go and check it out. It gives quite a lot of the history, fan history, of Brentford, like I said, it's called Bush Up Brentford documentary, and you find it on YouTube by Savvy um, uh, as well. So, um, but Mr. Push Up Brentford, I, I remember actually he uh, he's kind of almost associated because we're all listening to the uh, the sorted podcast now. But you can almost associate Mr. Push Up Brentford with the inception of the Besotted podcast because I don't know if you remember Laney, but. When do you remember the game that we actually started our very first besotted video? Because we actually did videos before we actually did podcasts, and they were like they were like a, a video version of what kind of what we do now. And we used to do match day videos for every single game. We didn't miss a game for about I don't know for about five or six seasons as well. Every home and away we did a video for that one. But do you remember the game that we did our very first besotted video? I do actually, because I was saying to my son about, um, you know, when I found out that he died, I remember saying we sat behind him at Yeovil away. And, um, you know, that was that we got we got um, probably 3000 push up Brentfords. Uh, we, we kind of heard that afternoon. Yeah. But yeah, it was Yeovil away, which That's shows right. you how far, far we've come and, yeah. and they, they haven't. They've, that's right they've just been Yeovil ironically they they actually beat us at Wembley um in the playoff final uh, I think it was 20 was it 2012 or 2013 to go up to the championship and we were crying in our soup yet again but they actually got, got relegated to the um the, the 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 National League South actually which is the same league as Hampton and Richmond and hopefully Dulwich Hamlet will still be in there next season as well so it kind of just shows you the big gulf between the two teams that time but at that time We'd actually just played Chelsea. I remember before the week beforehand, we played Chelsea and we had um, we were winning 2-1 with about seven minutes to go. And we were thinking it was brilliant. The atmosphere at Griffin Park was phenomenal. And then they popped up uh, seven minutes ago, scored an equaliser. It was a little bit heartbreaking, but we were still happy, you know, happy to be there at the days. And we just thought, yeah, we were bowling around thinking, look at us, Brentford. We've just drawn with Chelsea, you know, Premier League Chelsea. We're in the third tier. And then the following Saturday, we went down to Yeovil and it was a proper, proper kind of down to earth thing where we had sort of, you know, 3,000 push up Brentfords behind us. But Brentford did not push up at all because we got absolutely slammed 3 0. And uh, then we popped up the camera, stuck in front of people's faces, put together about six videos, put them together on when we got home that night, threw them up on YouTube. And that was the first ever besotted um video which is the oval away three nil loss after beating chelsea so like i said to you mr push up brentford you were very much part of the inception of the besotted podcast because those videos became the podcast so we thank you very much and uh yeah you know, god rest your soul and uh commiserations to your family all blessings going out to your family and uh the brentford family are right behind you there's also a um you did a you filmed a push up brentford uh, tutorial didn't you in the globe which um i've i've just uh, retweeted that so if you go onto the beside twitter beside twitter feed um and just scroll down a little bit to to us you know marking our respects to um to tony um and there's a link there to the youtube um, video which um you go, you go around the pub asking people to say push up brentford and everyone boos because it's not doing it right and there's about eight people that go around to oh, have our little crew at the back in the back room of the, uh, the globe and then all of a sudden the camera comes around to tony and he says push up brentford and the whole pub cheers because he's the only <laughs> one he's the only one that can do it right so yeah go, go, and, go and have a look it's uh you know it's uh it, it kind of really frames what we've been talking about that's right that's right um a little bit of news as well this week um we found out that our captain 
is leaving us at the end of the season. Well, in effect, he's kind of left us already, isn't he? Pontus Janssen got injured again. I mean, he was out for a long time, came back, and then he got injured uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then the news... Newcastle game. Yeah, yeah, Newcastle game, that's right. And then the news came back saying that Pontus will not be back before the end of the season. And as a result, um, we are, in effect, letting him go now. And he's going back to his beloved Malmo, a team that he he supports from the terraces. I mean, he's he's like, you know, proper, you know, I mean, if he if he was a Brentford fan, he'd be right up the Ealing Road, sort of kind of singing songs, you know, when we did back in the day. And he does exactly the same thing at Malmo. He goes up with his ultra characters and he goes right in the end. And he's actually just properly in there and yeah he's gone back to malmo to um to to finish off his career at malmo which is uh probably something that was always in the offing wasn't it laney yeah I, I, you know it's, it's, a, it's a shame that we won't see any more of him because he just you know it, he kind of was involved in the last few games and some people were saying that you know in, introducing him back into the team disrupted us a little uh, but you know, uh, he's, he's been such a brilliant part of the Brentford journey. He was, he's, you know, his signing was was probably you know a, a, t- a real turning point where we started to attract the caliber of players that could turn us into kind of Premier League wannabes, into kind of being able to actually dare to dream. And he, he, he pushed us forward a lot. Uh, you know, we, we did struggle defensively. Um, and his organisation, his leadership skills and his ability, um, it really did sort of, yeah, as, as I said, crank up that quality a, a fair few notches and probably um, meant that other players, you know, that may have kind of been humming and ahhing about coming to us, they actually did come. Um, and, you know, there was, I guess there's always going to be a bone of contention between Leeds fans who still adore him mostly. Um, and uh, you know, and bees who 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 are the ones that kind of he looks out for. But you know, I know I just think I just think it, it's it's just kind of a it's just a, it's not sad, but it's just like may, maybe it could have worked out just a little bit better where he could have come back for the last couple of matches or the last match against Man City and just kind of come around the pitch and um, after the game and uh, you know we you can hear free from desire after we do the double over man city and then say goodbye to herman and um, herman um, oh, don't say P- P- pontus in his magic hat um one one more time but I- i'm sure he will be back for that man city game um and i'm sure we will get a chance to say goodbye but it won't be with him you know having just played but yeah I, you know I, I i personally thank him for you know for what he's done and um I'm quite sure that the Premier League wouldn't have been a reality without him having signed. So uh, we do owe him a huge debt of uh, of gratitude, I believe. Yeah, thank you, Pontus. It's been absolutely marvellous. Like I said to you, when you signed, it was a little bit like, really? You know, and it was it was definitely a step up for Brentford because we were we were signed that the side that would never sign players like that because it was just deemed not the Brentford way. But I think they got to the stage where the offer came in and we felt if we're going to take ourselves and make a gamble and take ourselves to the next level when we're in the championship, we need to sign a player like Pontus. Leeds did uh, label him um, all sorts of names after he joined us. Um, they seemed to love him when he was with them. But as soon as he did that, he was a bottler. He was this. He, he's the one that sort of kind of never stuck up for the side. He disappeared when things got tough is what they used to say. But um, we never saw that. In, in Pontus, you know, we just saw, you know, somebody who loved his football, loved the team he's playing for and was truly professional. And we had somebody who worked for the club who turned around to us. And when Pontus joined, he just said, oh, my God, this guy, he literally when he walks in, he is just the presence and you could just feel the presence. And he is just such a leader and he's taken the team to another level just by being there. So I think that he was the he was the linchpin in in helping to get us to another level. And I suppose you know, other players looked around and th- thought, hold a second, if, if Pontus Janssen's there, I could I could join that club as well. So thank you, Pontus, for your time at the Bees. Hopefully we'll see you at Man City where we uh, we make them cry in their soup at the final day of the season when they Ooh. think they're going to absolutely cruise it and beat Ooh. Arsenal to the trophy. But we actually do Arsenal a favour for us so they can stop moaning at us every time we go down there and we take some points off of them. So which is all good. But anyway, we've spoken enough having a little bit of a shoot to the breeze. We're going to take a little break and then we're going to cast our mind back to last weekend when we went up to Wolverhampton. Saturday, we went up to Wolverhampton and uh, let's just say that things didn't quite go 
according to plan. Uh, it wasn't a disaster, but it was kind of one of those games where we could have won if we'd taken our chances early on in the game. But as the game went on, the longer the game went on, the more Wolves came into it, the more chances that Wolves had. They didn't have massive chances, but they were they seemed kind of hungrier, more up for it. They kind of battled more and uh, they could have and they, and they got the two goals to get the three points and uh it was kind of one of those ones where you just have to t- just just go home and just say listen it just didn't really happen for us i mean it was a it was a it was i'd say it was a disappointing day but i wasn't massively disappointed as i have been you know going to other games like burnley last season and other places where you kind of like got this massive disappointment because uh i don't know maybe it's because the way that the season's gone so far Maybe it's the fact that we kind of, yeah, we, we had a couple of chances earlier on and Wolves kind of, you know, we, they took their goals, a couple of fluffs by Brentford, to be quite honest with you. And I suppose we're probably pretty safe and, uh, uh, you know, we're probably happy from where we are. So I, you know, we went up there, had a quick Swifty beforehand, Cup Shop Anne had her birthday as well, had a quick birthday drink with her beforehand, had a quick drink with her afterwards. Then we went down and drove down in me, me electric, the new electric. I finally worked out how to plug it in and actually get it charged up. And uh, we just stopped off on the way back at a, a little rural pub. And it was sort of a nice afternoon outside of the, the 90 minutes of the football, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, kick football out of football afternoon and the football ruins the day out. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean about uh, it, it not being kind of like the end of the world. I, I, I guess it's you know, are we going to let three consecutive de- three consecutive defeats kind of ruin all the good that the, the you know the team have done? Uh, and and equally, are the team going to let the season slip away and you know and undo all the good work they've done? We're kind of at a bit of a crossroads, I think, um, and. You know, the two two of those defeats, you know, Man United and Newcastle were, you know, they went with a full book, I guess. You know, we could have we could have deserved a bit more out of both of those. Don't think we really deserved anything more out of the game um, at Molyneux. Although, you know, if Josh De Silva takes that big chance early on um, and a couple of other things kind of go our way, but you're right, they they were hungrier. Um, they were kind of chasing us down. They were pressing us, and that's really why the two goals came around, came about. Really, you know, they were trying to chase the ball down as we were trying to clear it, and they didn't. They didn't just sit back and accept the clearance um, and then build again. They were kind of giving our defenders like zero, zero minutes, you know, zero seconds on the ball, um, and the balls were hit against them, and they ended up ricocheting into the go- into the goal, but. You know, it's um, you know. At the same time, David Raya pulled off a lot of a lot of I thought were good saves, but um, they were probably shots from distance. Uh, yeah, if we'd have, if we'd have won that, I, I I think it would have been a bit of a, <laughs> a bit unjust. But you know, we have we have got draws in that long long run um, from performances that weren't dissimilar to that. There was there seemed there definitely seemed to be. Uh, that sense of adventure that we're kind of famous for, or, or we, you know, we, we think that our team is all about kind of um, upsetting the, the form book and going to going to um, away great grounds and giving little or no respect. We, we we seem to that sense of adventure seems to have kind of gone a bit awol the last couple of games, couple of away games, um, and, and Villa come on Saturday and we need to we need to kind of reignite that. So I, I just don't I just I just don't think it does us justice to kind of just let the season just peter out, Bill. No, nah, no, nah, absolutely not. I mean listen, we've talked about it. Let's just go and hear what the fans had to say who were in the ground and also in the pub after the game. No intent, no energy. Feels like we've uh, we've gone on the beach, doesn't it? Four good chances early on. We take one, obviously different game. Yeah, they pressed well, didn't feel like we could overcome that. It showed uh, which team needed the points. Wolves are desperate, but they, they, they channeled it really well. We channeled a uh, lack of confidence and a uh, lack of really needing the points. So yeah, disappointing, bit of rubbish, frustrating, all that. A little bit going for the motions, yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say we're on the beat, but I don't know, there was, there was something missing today. A little bit of desire for me from early in the season, you know. 
And yeah, we're, we're, we're safe, but for me, it's you know, looking at next season now, we're losing Raya, we're losing Pontus. Iman's probably going to suspend him for three, you know, for a few months. Let's have a look, you know, let's give a few fringe players a chance now and let's see where we go to. A bit of an off performance today. I think two mistakes, obviously, for them, for us, to gave them the goals. But um, yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't to be today. We weren't at the races today. We were poor. There was no midfield. There was no midfield giving service to the front, front, front players. Um, just, just very pedestrian, lacking that bit of energy just to get the game going. You go one nil down, okay, fair enough. You're one nil down away at home. Inject some energy into it. Try and create something. We weren't creating any chances for Tony up front, who didn't really have a good game. Elite, elite strikers, if they are marked out of the game, can have that little bit of X factor to try and get something out of it. And fortunately today, Tony, it wasn't Tony's day and he just couldn't find that extra bit. After the first 20 minutes or so, I thought we all sort of took control and we, we, we never really looked in difficulty. A couple of shots, a couple of scary moments, but nothing, nothing too strenuous. You know, Brentford, brilliant, done a great job. I used to like going where, where there was a pub on the four corners because right, we'd try right. and go around twice and have eight points. And yes. That was when we were in the second and third division. We Fun just, days, we, though, weren't they? Fun oh, days. Oh, brilliant, yeah. But we. The, the only thing I dislike about it is too much on it. It's, there's too much, if you like, it's too much at stake. Yeah. And that took some of the enjoyment out in VAR as well. But yeah, nonetheless, yeah. having said all of that, I like to see teams like Brentford in the, in the Premier League, like Wolves in the Premier League, because it, it chops things up a little bit and yeah. they, they, they disrupt the norm. Yes. And long may it continue. That's right. what, what, what I get a lot of pleasure from is seeing Chelsea in the. Oh, in yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They weren't happy last week, were they? they, they with that goal. They've lost again today, right. three in a row. You, they, they, then you've got Tottenham losing to. To, to Bournemouth today you can never rely on them for anything can you you know <laughs> fancy having a player that scored 300 goals in 10 seasons and never won anything you know there's yeah. a break here <laughs> so, so when you look at all that and the amount of money they spent both teams us and Brentford massively overachieving and, and long may continue used to punk because it's great national but we just weren't at the races today there you go fans after the game Beast fans resigned Wolves fans, fairly, you know, I thought they were, I thought they were fair, fair enough. Actually, they they spoke quite um, positively and fairly about the match. And uh, yeah, we didn't get anything out of it. You've got to move on. You know, we've still got seven games to go. Um, we're laughing because we were saying it'd be quite funny if, like, because we're sitting down there thinking, oh, season's petering out a little bit. And there was an article in one of the newspapers out there that said, you know, is Brentford's season going to peter out? Um, we've lost three games in a row. You know, last season we lost. What, two months ago, we lost every single game after we played Villa, ironically, bar the Crystal Palace game, until it came to, uh, I think it was, was it Norwich? And then the Norwich Ooh. game came and then it was like, bang, here you go. So, you know, we're used to losing three games in a row and in the, in the Premier League, that's always going to happen. But the team like us, you know, next minute they just pick themselves up and you turn the things around. And uh, I said to him, it wouldn't be quite funny if we now went off and won all our last seven games, he says, touch wood. Um, that would actually be quite quite hilarious because could you imagine going into the final game of the season? I keep talking about this final game of the season because playing Man City doesn't really bother me that much. But I do, I do like sort of going into a game that means something. And if going into the Man City game means something, um, it could be quite good for us, even though saying that, I'd like it to probably mean a little bit less than it did for the Leeds game because that game obviously meant so much for us last season. We fluffed it massively because we were so high on the ball and trying to relegate Leeds. We just we just fluffed it and just allowed them to return to the league. Um, but yeah, Lady, I mean, this Wolves loss, looking at the XG, I mean, we actually had more than them. A lot of people say, oh, that shows you it doesn't mean anything, you know, but the Justice Silver chance on uh, I think 29 minutes is where he it was down the other end you know we had the flamethrowers in our eyes so I think our eyes were still kind of like you know had big dots and black dots in front of them because of the flamethrowers are just kind of just like blinded us um, by the side of the pitch uh, Wolves have got these flamethrowers by the side of their pitch by the way if you if you didn't know and they're just it's quite bizarre um, but anyway Joshua Silva in front of the goal bang and I think he I think he dinked it he put it over I think it was when it was easier to score um, it was 79% of those chances normally go in the back of the net, right? So that was basically as good as a penalty. Um, and it was in the six-yard box and he missed it. And if he had scored that goal, 
it'd have been very different. And that was a massive chance. But other than that, Wolves had one big chance as well. Um, and then they had another sort of slightly smaller chance. And then the rest of them were all sort of tiny little dots dotted around the edge of the area. And for us, we had tiny little dots. So other than the, the, the chances that we had, we were sort of similar in chances. I think the difference is Wolves actually took their chances. Now, looking at it like that, Laney, I mean, Thomas Frank in the press um, conference afterwards sort of turned around and said, you know, oh, you know, I thought we basically, you know, we were all right. We just um, didn't take our chances. We, you know, we, we just didn't get the result we wanted to. And a lot of people are like, come on, Thomas, come on, give us a break here, mate. You know, we just we just weren't very good. But if you look at it statistical wise, um, he's probably talking spot on, don't you think? Well, the, that's the problem with, with stats, isn't it, and XG. No, no one wants to talk about it and no one wants to be lectured about it when you lose, um, which is it's a shame, really, because you, 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 have, you, have, to, you have to take the stats when you, when you win and when you lose, especially a team like us that, we, that you know, um, rely on. Well, teams and like stats. Brentford, yeah? T- teams like Brentford, yeah. <laughs> teams like Brentford who, um, uh, it's, stats is, is one of our, you know, one of our kind of... Um, the, the tools we use to you know to, to, to bring about success so um you know if, if thomas and the the stats guys are, are saying you know it actually it wasn't that bad uh then they they probably are onto something well does it does that does it mean you does it mean that you should feel like it, it, it was close no it, it doesn't because you know you, you we, we've set off our, our experiences are completely different as aren't they as fans and as players and as, and as club officials, you know, we, we set off early and, you know, um, we, we go with uh, expectations and hopes and um, we spend a lot of money on going up there and you, you, you're wanting to see um, a decent performance where your team do themselves justice. And, 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 they, and they didn't do that, I, I, I don't think. So, you know, fan, fans that are disgruntled afterwards, I, I see your point. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I was grumpy afterwards as well. You know, I, I, it was, I, I said on the pod, I wish I hadn't gone. And I don't often say that, and um, it, it was that kind of game. But you know, it's it's it has to be put into some sort of context. You know, we're still we're still sort of ninth in the league, and um, we've got everything to play for. And yeah, I mean, going to Wolves, it's a game that we probably you know expect to get at least a point from. Um, especially when you look for the previous three, you know, the, the Brighton thrill draw, the Man United narrow 1-0 defeat, the Newcastle 2-1 defeat just by a goal, deserves something more out of that. It, we were looking in Sharda started again and, you know, he had a really good impact against Newcastle. So we, we, we were hoping for a fair, a fair bit, but it just didn't pan out like that. And, you know, Tony hit the bar late on. Um, there was another header that was saved in the line from a from a free kick that was floated in and, and, and headed down. Um, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, got a point out of that. And uh, but you know, it's 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 something we have to I, I say put behind us really quickly. Um, so yeah, so like summing that up, I can I can see why people are pissed off and people were pissed off, but I can equally see why Thomas is saying, oh, hold on a minute, that you know. We, we did enough to get something out of that game. So, you know, everyone's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just looking at the match, the stats, uh, Wolves, they stole the ball a lot from us. And they're also effective at creating goal scoring opportunities from long shots. And they're actually, well, they finished well, you know. So, and, and, and actually, they had no significant weaknesses. You know, they played with width, they favoured long shots, and they favoured long balls for us. What we were good at just about was stealing the ball from them. Um, we were poor at finishing and we committed a high number of individual errors. We played with width and attacked down the left side. And the top players, according to who scored, were Diego Costa, we had Nunes, we had Lamina. Uh, and then we had David Rea in the middle of there who pulled off a few saves, like I said. And then they got Craig Dawson. So all the top players, as far as they were concerned, were all Wolves. Even though, interestingly, Ivan Tony had the most shots. He had five shots in that game with Diego Costa having three. Uh, and, uh, and, and Kahuna with a couple as well Ethan Pinnock top of the pile in his tackling seven tackles massive seven tackles there from Ethan Pinnock as well uh, five from Nunes as well and uh, Nunes as well four dribbles during the game and Boomer with three so you know overall they were uh, they were dominant if you look at all those things and we just didn't quite get the result um, Wolverhampton just quickly we briefly talked about it you said I don't like going to Wolverhampton for me I, I would say first of all We've got some Wolverhampton friends. We've got the London Wolves. We we know you know we know quite a few people from Wolverhampton. So this is not a disrespect on them. 
at all. I think the frustration that we have with Wolverhampton, it's always been the same with Wolverhampton, is that uh, when they first got to the, the championship, and I remember we were very excited to go down there, then we found out actually you are literally going to be actually just ferried into one pub which was, uh, I think it was probably the Blue Brick at the time. No, it was. It might have been a different one. I think it might have been the, I think it was an Aussie pub. And they ferried all the Brentford fans in there. And other than that, you could not go into any other pub. They had bouncers on every single door. We managed to find a pub which was on the outskirts, which we started to go to for years, which had a tree in the middle of the toilet, growing in the middle of the toilet. It was kind of those one of those weird pubs, which had a tree in the toilet. We used to go there for quite a few times. And that kind of sort of made our Wolverhampton trips okay, because we weren't caught up with this old bouncer, we're not going to allow you in we're not going to allow you to drink where you want to so that was kind of cool but I think you know after playing for them for so many years we kind of were a little bit kind of fed up of the kind of lack of hospitality in Wolverhampton from the local establishments for whatever reason that may be and I think that's the reason why we're a little bit kind of down on going to Wolverhampton isn't it Laney? Yeah I, th- I think so you know there was a, a big police presence outside the ground the West Midlands police were there in, in, in numbers because of incidents, apparently. Um, you might have seen some of that on, on social media. We'll, we'll, we'll skirt straight past that, though. Um, something we're not interested in at all. Um, so, yeah, it, it, yeah it's, uh, it, for varying reasons, it's, it's, the, it's the fixture I least look forward to. And, that's, and again, you know, I echo you, Bill, it's nothing against you know the town or 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 the fans it's just literally we don't feel very welcome there and if you can't if you can't have a, a nice beer in a nice pub that's that's most of that's most of your your you know your match day kind of scuppered isn't it and then especially when you lose yeah especially <laughs> when you lose yeah, yeah. that's true yeah. yeah but we got to, we got to put that behind us as i say and um got to get on with these next seven games so there's there's some there's some juicy ones there yeah definitely going to get on with the seven games and we're going to get on with jb who's going to get on with his funk and his facts jb's got some facts and funk let's hear what he has got to say hello jonathan burchard here again Saturday at Wolves was our third successive Premier League defeat, but it was only the second loss to a team in the lower half of the league in the 17 games against them so far this season. It was our first 2-0 defeat of the season, and our first 2-0 loss to Wolves since Phil Holder's side visited in 1992. Last week, news broke that Pontus may have played his last game for us. After four years, he'll be leading at the end of the season. Thomas Frank made him skipper from his first game, the opening game of the championship season in 2019 when we lost 1-0 to Birmingham. He took the armband from the transferred Romain Sawyers, who had been Thomas's first captain, replacing the different captain for every game tried by Dean Smith at the end of his tenure. In the last 50 years, there have only been three other players who wore the armband for all of their games. Paul Evans, signed in 1999, achieved that for all of his 154 matches. There were a couple of others whose tenure was much shorter, Ricky Newman in 2005, and John Mackey a couple of years later. Next up, Aston Villa. The away match saw us concede three goals within 15 minutes, the first time we'd done that since losing 4-2 to Preston in the Championship two years earlier. It was the only Premier League game so far this season where Ben Mee hasn't been in our starting eleven. Since Villa reappeared on our fixture list back in 2016, we've never won any of the five away games, and, as it stands, We've won all four of the home fixtures. There you go, JB, with facts and funk and uh, getting funky as we've got Villa coming to town on Saturday. Our old boy, Ollie Watkins. And uh, when we played him earlier in the season, well, I don't know. Yeah, did he play? I mean, he might have popped off. I think he was injured. Then he came yeah, on. But... He, he did come on. Yeah. yeah, he came on. That's right. But the Villa fans weren't particularly overly enamoured by him at the time. And, and and for a period of time, he looked like he was going to be properly out of favour, Ollie Watkins. And people were like, yeah, whatever, Ollie Watkins. But now he's really turned it around and he's doing the business for them. And they're coming down to us having won quite a lot of games in a row. So we need to be on our P's and Q's, isn't it, Laney? Yes, we do. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's a weird one, isn't it? As you say, because you know Ollie Watkins is is one of our own still. We, we we've got so many fond memories of of him, uh, and you know we we do kind of want him to do well, of course, but obviously not this not this weekend because uh, we we need to win again. You know, it's uh, we don't need to, but I mean, you know, we just we just want to, and we need, we normally do all right against Villa apart from the game. Up at their place early on in the season, where you know we just got we just got blown away. Um, cut, they come out of the blocks, and they they showed the kind of form that's been lacking throughout the season, apart from this, you know the, the recent few weeks. I showed you what they can do, um, and it was always baffling to the to the Villa fans and and to the and to the you know the, clearly the management and the owners. Hence, that's why they you know, kept churning churning through uh, through the head coaches. Um, to work out why why they weren't clicking, and um, on their day they're blessed with some incredible attacking talent. Uh, we have to make sure that that attacking talent is is wasteful, and we're we're really tight at the back, and we start creating again. So yeah, it's it's always good to see Ollie. Um, and um, you know, he, he, to be fair, what he does with Woody and um, you know, he's the, just just the caliber of him as a person. Um, I think he's had his with his partner. I think they've had their second kid this week, so um, it's an it's an it's, you know, it's an important week for him. Maybe he gets parental leave for the for the day bill. Maybe he gets a day off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's get paternity leave. Hopefully, uh, he, he's out, he's out for at least a week because he needs to take some time off with his family. And, and and chill out. So we, we wish him congratulations. And and we say honestly, Ollie, if you want to take a rest this weekend, you're more than welcome to take a take a rest this weekend. But um, to talk about Aston Villa, I mean, you know, we're talking about Ollie Watkins. We're talking about the Villa. Um, but we thought, if you need to know anything about Villa, best to go over to Villa to Chris from Villa together. He's going to give us everything we need to know about Villa. Hello, my name is Chris Ellis and I'm doing an opposition preview for the Brentford against Aston Villa game this Saturday. Obviously, Aston Villa's form has been pretty good. We've run five on the spin and it's Villa. It's the first time since 1998 that Aston Villa have won five in a row in the Premier League. So it really does show the kind of form that we're in at the moment. Ollie Watkins has the joint most goals and assists combined uh, for players since the World Cup joint with um, Erling Haaland and the whole team has been absolutely fantastic the last few weeks I think a lot of people coming into the coming into the um, obviously a lot of people coming into um, the Newcastle game would have you know, expected it to be a, a difficult game for us, and um, and it was. But it, we, you know, we, we played so well, best performance of the season by far, and, it, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, Going to be a difficult end to the season for Villa, um, obviously ourselves, along with Brentford, uh, Brighton, Liverpool, um, Spurs as well at the moment. In all fairness, challenging for those European spots uh, outside of the top four. After Brentford, we're at home to Fulham. Uh, travel to Manchester United and then Wolves, Spurs at home, Liverpool away, Brighton at home. So if Aston Villa do fail to get top six or seven and Europa League or the Conference League, then in all fairness, we won't have been, you know, we won't deserve to get there because if we haven't been able to get the uh, results against those teams that are amongst us, then then so be, you know, you need to kind of be deserve deserved deserve winners so to speak um just going to look back at the game against newcastle 3-0 win and it was i don't want to say dominance but it was a very dominant performance in terms of uh score line was good where the goal disallowed at the post at the bar really good and what's been good for us mention him again ollie watkins and brentford fans will know him well um he's gone up another level under unai emery and he was obviously the guy that was that was furthest forward villa flanked with Alex Moreno, who was who was pushing high, got a, got an assist for Ollie Watkins. He did set up the he, he played in Ollie for the goalie that was disallowed. Played the ball across for Watkins, who hit the bar. Really, really good player going forward from left back. He was a thirteen point five million pound signing in January from Real Betis. 
we had Dendonka sitting in front of the back four. Um, Louise was just in front of him. And then you had Ramsey and Buendia um, getting forward to support Watkins. And John McGinn as well getting forward to support him. So we defensively were solid, but we had the, the, the runners that were willing to get forward and get us in there. And it's um, it's been some really, really good performances so far. Um, and hopefully we can kind of push this on. Um, going to be a difficult Brentford game. I think you look back at the the 4-0 win going back to um, October, November time. And it was a, I don't want to say a backlash performance, but it was a, the first game after Steven Gerrard. Um, it was Aaron Danks who was in charge for that game. 4-0 win, good performance. And I think... Uh, that game, it seemed, it felt like a lot of players' shackles were off and they kind of played with a bit of freedom and, and we got the result off the back of that. Um, it was a good win. But I think this this week against Brentford, um, away from home, is going to be difficult for us. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be really, really tough for us to get at Brentford. And Brentford are in the same boat as us um, to try and to get into those, the top, you know, top six, top seven for the season. I think... A lot of people looking in Brentford. Okay, their form hasn't been great recently, but Brentford have had a really, really good season. Their trajectory over the last three or four years has been phenomenal, and I think a lot of people look at it and say, "Do you know what? Over the the season, they, you know, the course of the season, they they deserve to be where they are, and and would probably deserve to get into Europe." Um, the I think the big difference at the moment for Aston Villa is Unai Emery came in. What an absolute transformation that he has made. I think he gets bad press because his time at Arsenal. Now, OK, he probably did underperform. I think fifth place in his first season, eighth in his second season, then was sacked, um, falling away in his, his third season. Um, it was always going to be difficult to uh, replace Arsene Wenger and that was always going to be uh, difficult for him. I think Arsenal, similar to Villa, you know, had some good results, but at the same time kind of struggled um, in bigger games, and I think that that's the criticism that people have thrown at Unai Emery um, in his career. You know, obviously went to PSG, won the league and the cup with them, um, but didn't win the, the the Champions League, which is the one they want. But no one has done, and he's got um, second best uh, win percentage of PSG managers since the new owners came in um, in the 2010s. So. He's a good manager, we know that, and uh, you know he's got European pedigree. What he brings, I think, for Aston Villa really is that it's, the, it's almost a desire, and he's got the desire, he's got it instilled in the players, a desire to do well, and a desire for the players to play at their top level. And he's getting the best out of all these players, and for Aston Villa, a lot of fans in probably January <clears throat> would have looked at people like Esri Konza, John McGinn and probably even Matty Cash and maybe even Ollie Watkins and said these guys are not good enough these guys need to leave Aston Villa and there, there's players there who Esri Konza and Tyra Mings have, have built an absolutely incredible partnership the last few weeks um, Matty Cash um, I think his form suffered because of being away at the World Cup, so didn't spend the time with Unai Emery that, that we could have wanted him to, but at the time it looked like he was done. And he came in for Ashley Young and was fantastic before he got injured again. Uh, John McGinn, genuinely, I think a good proportion of the fan base would have said he wasn't good enough and, and would have been happy for him to go. And I think, um, you know, I think for John McGinn... Unai Emery's given him the confidence. He's got him playing his best and it's been absolutely fan fantastic. <clears throat> and and we've just been brilliant. And, and it's it's an odd one because our form has been that good and it's the same with, with any team. Your form's that good, um, the expectations go. And it's probably the same for Brentford fans. Probably start of the season, you'd have been happy to probably push, you know, top eight, top half would have been, a, you know, still a good season. Because you've been around the top six or seven for the majority of the season, the expectations are there in terms of wanting to get Europe. And uh, going back to what probably only five or six weeks ago, before we played Chelsea, we were 11th in the league and we'd been 11th for such a long time. And it felt like we wouldn't break the top 10. 
and my expectations then was I'd be really happy to break the top 10 and at the moment now it looks like we probably will finish in the top 10 but because we are sixth and we've been sixth for, for, for a couple of weeks I want European football um, you know and we haven't had it for so long so the expectations have risen um, and yeah I think I think there is the expectations gone up the players have been fantastic and that will go with, with the expectation how we end this season hopefully will help us going into next season and looking to build on it um, I think you know Unai Emery is just he's squeezed every bit of ability out of these players and I think with Ollie Watkins in particular, who's the you know the man of the moment, he's getting goals, getting assists. Um, I think they've taken him to the next level in terms of they've shown uh, they've shown in clips of strikers. Um, I think he's watched Edison Cavani, who who's played under Emery, Emery at PSG, and and we know he's an incredible goal scorer in Europe. Um, a guy that um, a guy that. Uh, yeah, he just get, it seems to be getting better and better every week. And obviously, Brentford fans will know, know, you know, he's kind of he's, he's a willing runner. He's got a bit of pace, um, gets amongst the goals, but he really has gone up another level. Um, and hopefully, if his, if his goals continue, um, you know, we, we really could get on that. You know, the European tour next season, which would be incredible. Um, like I said earlier, the fixtures are difficult. Uh, Liverpool, I think, you know, they're they're eighth at the moment. Uh, seventh or eighth, they they could they could stop us getting Europe. Brentford could as well. We've got Spurs to play. Man United, really really tough fixtures. Um, like I said, if we're gonna make Europe, then it will have been a deserved kind of finish in terms of deserved by beating the teams that you've got to compete with. It's like Arsenal and Man City at the top. If Man City win the league, it's probably going to be after beating Arsenal. And if they're beating Arsenal, then they deserve winners. If Arsenal win the league, they're probably going to have to beat Man City. So it's deserved that way. It's the same for Villa. We've got to beat the guys around us. Um, when you look against the Brentford game, what we've done a lot of games away from home is we've been compact and we've looked to, to beat teams on the break and the counter. And I think we will still do that, um, even though probably Villa and Brentford are at similar levels at the moment. Um, I, I think we still form, form wise Brentford's form has not been as good as Aston Villa's but like I said Brentford are a side that are in the right area of the table so we're competing for Europe we're competing for the same spots um, obviously go, you know it, it'll be uh, you know uh, Ivan Tony is going to be the main man that, that we're going to look at um, he's, he's, you know, I know he's, he's not been scoring uh, the goals um, as many recently, but a guy that goal scoring record has been fantastic this season. Second highest English goal scorer after Harry Kane. And there's a lot of good players that that uh, that Brentford have. Um, <clears throat> always been a fan of Brian and Buemo. I think Rico Henry and Aaron Hickey are good attacking fullbacks. And in the midfield. Um, you know, if you go for the same, looking at De Silva, Norgard, Jensen, they're all good technicians that work hard and they complement each other well. And I think they're players that 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 uh, Brentford are able to to bring off the bench and bring in. You're looking at Damsgaard, could be a good player. Visser scored against us last season um, when we played away at Brentford, um, and at the back. Pinnock and me, they've both got good performances in them, so it's going to be a difficult game, difficult for Aston Villa to, to break down. Um, but saying that, I think we will just about have enough, and I, I'm, I'm going to go for a 1 0 Villa win. Um, at the moment, we seem to just be just the form was incredible, the players are on a high. So I think going from there, I think we can get a, get a one 0 win. I think we'll we'll soak up, we'll spend a, a lot of time soaking up pressure, and we'll get a goal. Um, and to be honest, I don't care who scores it, whether it's a header, a, a great strike, or it goes in off off someone's backside. Um, you know they all count, and I think really going forward, that's going to be key for us. Um, that's that's my expectation. Um, it's going to be a really difficult end to the season. Villa and Brentford, like I've said, in the same boat. I know we. I think we're four points ahead of. We're in sixth, four points ahead of Brentford at the moment. Um, Brentford and in in ninth place. Brighton, Liverpool, Brentford. Um, they're all teams that that could really make Europe top six, top seven. 
Um, I don't want to write anyone off for, for top four at the moment, the way that kind of Newcastle and Spurs have been. But I think I think Villa, Brighton, Brentford, you know, really expectations could be that they could make, um, you know, the top six or seven. Um, going for a 1-0 win for Aston Villa, hope so. Going to be a difficult game. I take a good away point and hoping for a good end of the season for both teams. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, and I'll speak soon up the Villa so there you go Chris from Villa together very uh, happy uh, no doubt and obviously he's happy with the game that happened earlier in the season which uh, Watkins did come on he didn't no, did come on but he was he was right right in the mix wasn't he Laney well, he scored he scored the fourth didn't he um, yeah. up, at, up at our end so yeah, yeah. That's mm. right, that's right. And he didn't celebrate, if I remember rightly, as well. Um, and that was early on in the season. It was uh, September, if I remember October. rightly. October. It was October. It October. Yeah, it's October. That's right. We had the two dodgy games in October where we lost to Newcastle 5-1 and we lost to Villa 4-0. And, and it was one of those ones where, again, as a football fan, you know, people said to us, you come in the Premier League and sometimes you're going to get a right good bashing. And uh, we had had an all right start to the season, and all of a sudden we get the filler, and they just they just came out of the traps. They beat us four nil, and we had no qualms. We just you know just couldn't say anything. We just said, look, you know, we we just got to just go away and come back again, and hopefully we'll be okay. Um, and that that was a time when it looked like our season was actually running away from us because we we were having a sort of kind of few relatively dicky. I think we played Chelsea, which we probably could have beaten them but we didn't beat them we lost to Newcastle a few weeks beforehand then we went to Forest and we could have should have beaten them but then they equalised in the last minute and we thought oh no we get to the World Cup on our knees and then up pops Man City and we beat them so like I said to you it's a funny old game but that that Villa game I'd like to think that um, it was a blip in our season and it was a blip at the time and we've kind of learnt from it And uh, but we're going to have to be on our toes at the weekend isn't it? We 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 come up against another form team. That's you know that's the second home game on the trot, and uh, and and Wolves to a certain extent because they they've beaten Chelsea, um, the the previous home game. Which you know you might say oh well, Chelsea having a shit season, but you know it's still it's still you've got to go and beat a team that you know is is blessed with incredible talent. So uh, yeah, um, we, we we need to have a game plan. I'm sure we will have one. Thomas knows exactly what he needs. Yes. Uh, we need. Um, yes. I'm not sure he did on, on last Saturday, but um, most of the time he does. And uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I've got a lot of lot of Villa mates, uh, Colin and John in particular. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm, it's, it's a game I look forward to, and it's a game we have to we have to make up for, as you as you mentioned, you know, that four 0 drubbing at their place in October. Right, yeah, so looking at what Eston Villa are good at, they're good at finishing, scoring chances, creating chances through through balls and through individual skill, creating chances as well. They're good at where they're weak at defending against long shots, fouling in dangerous areas, aerial duels, avoiding individual errors and defending set pieces. They like to attack down the left, take long shots. They play the offside trap. Um, normally opponents play aggressively against them and they play in their own half. So, you know, uh, there's pros and cons there things that we need to watch out for but still things that we can get at Villa amongst that lot in there yeah I think so uh, but you know Villa are going to have it shows you what what a string of wins will do you know they, they've been catapulted from you know just just slightly outside the relegation uh, mix you know where where Wolves are probably now or where Palace are now um, all the way to three points behind Tottenham in fifth and six points behind Newcastle in fourth and you know, another couple of wins. Uh, they're they're right in that European uh, Champions League uh, shakedown. Premier League is is cruel. I mean, just because you won five or six in the trot, there's normally a defeat coming, and uh, we just have to make sure that we we put the spanner firmly in the Villa wheel on Saturday. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, looking at sides. <clears throat> I mean, for for Villa. I mean, it's interesting. Again, we talked about this before when we played Brighton. Um, and, and they've also got a, a sort of World Cup winner in their in their midst as well. And it's like quite bizarre when you sort of kind of think about these things as well. You know, is it Emmy Martinez as well? You've got Tyrone Mings um, and Konza. And it's funny because we always talk about Ollie Watkins, but we never talk about Konza because literally Konza was there 
uh, for such a short space of time and he just didn't really endear himself you just never you would never have known he's a Brentford player would you no I've, I heard it described once as um I've had a long I've had longer farts than concert was at Brentford and it was it was um yeah blinking you miss him I mean yeah he did have a good season but it was very much passing through wasn't it and we, we did we did have a we did make a, a fair few quid out of him and uh, but you know he's one that in his first or his second season at Villa, he was being lauded as um, you know as a as a as a you know a, a player to you know maybe picked up by Liverpool to play alongside um, Van Dijk, um, and he's kind of gone off the boil a, a little bit, I'd say. But um, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's he, he did play a, another part in that stepping stone um, for, for Brentford. Yeah, yeah, and again, just looking, Emmy Redia, who's a player who we. Uh, we had a lot of say, respect for what we were, you know, he was like, he was the Don back in the championship as well, wasn't he? Um, yes. And, and then he came to, to Villa and then he had a bit of a funny start at Villa. But if I remember rightly, I think he might have scored a goal against us that last season. So it's one of those typical ones where, you know, it's like, oh, he's not, oh no, he scored against the Bees, like, you know. So, you know, we've got people like him, that uh, Bailey as well, who's quite a decent player as well, who was, uh, I think he was up and coming last season, but now he's really up and come. And of course, we know the John McGinn, who is uh, back from the, uh, from the championship days as well, where they were, you know, uh, he was big in the game back in the day. So they've got some, they've got some players in their side that we need to uh, keep on our toes against for sure you know so um but listen i mean aston villa coming down at the weekend like i said to you uh, always come down lively bunch like i said to you quite a few of them are going to be down the globe we've got the sutton coalfield lot who are a really nice bunch of lads and lasses they're going to be down there as well do you think they're going to be and i'll tell you something i've got to tell that story as well it did make me laugh because it just shows just to show you i'm just thinking about the sort of where we started with Villa and where we kind of where we are now when Villa came down to the championship and they were like they, I think they'd never been relegated before that so for, for them that was kind of like what the hell's going on here and they thought they were going to go straight back up uh, and that wasn't happening because they think they had Steve Bruce as manager at the time and it's just like no you don't understand Steve Bruce just no it's just a no Villa but they thought yeah we got him and we're going to do the business and then I remember we had Scott Hogan at the time and Scott Hogan was scoring he was injured then he came back and he was scoring goals for fun so he scored loads of goals in the first three months of the season so Villa thought I tell you what let's just go and nick Scott Hogan off them so uh they went and they signed Scott Hogan in the January window and we were a little bit peeved because thinking ah oh, Scott Hogan and you know Brentford were a little bit like look we're cool with that man they've given us 12 million you know for Scott Hogan we're just like oh no we're, we're, we're gonna go relegated they're like no nah, Brentford like no nah, man we're cool and then we went inside the pub and the Sutton Coalfield lads were there and they they've just signed our player for 12 million and they've just they, they had no idea who he was where he played what he did and they were, all of them they're asking us who's this scott hogan is, is he any good what's he done and we're thinking you've been in the division for like four months and he's been scoring goals like every week and you've just signed him for 12 million and literally they had no idea i mean do you remember that yes yeah he was you know um entitled <laughs> at the time i mean didn't say it was but it's just it's just funny so that's what happened when they first but now when you speak to the villa fans because they are um, they've been in the division, they've gone up and we kind of, I think, seen as a little bit more kind of, of, of an equal where, you know, you've got your Man Cities and that, the teams at the top and then the teams that are sort of kind of playing around in the middle. So if you speak to them now, they'll actually talk to you. They know more about what's going on. They know more about your team. They've got a lot more respect for you. And maybe we actually bought that respect as well, which I think is uh, which is quite nice. But it just goes to show you the difference what what eight me eight years or six or seven years makes actually in the way that you are kind of treated by the opposition fan but you know but that's all good though isn't it laney yeah yeah i don't yeah I, I know a lot about aston villa i produced their 150 year book big coffee table book you know 1874 was when they were founded and they they were winning titles and doubles um since Back in that those days, the huge European Cup winners, when you had to be a proper champion to win, you know, um, to be included in the European Cup, let alone you know fourth place. Um, they are they're a proper club, and you know Villa Park is probably my favourite away ground. So you know it's they've got heritage, and they're they're right to kind of have that kind of big club, um, big game mentality, um, unlike Leeds. 
Lee's. <laughs> and let's not talk about you, you could talk about Lee's if you want to, Lady, because no, they're no, right. let's wait um, a couple couple more weeks. I think. Okay, we'll right, right. We won't we won't talk about Lee's. But you could talk about QPR if you want to. Tell you who? something. Who? Uh, he, when I met Dar- Gareth Ainsworth, um um just before just after he played his first game against Blackburn Rovers. So he managed um QPR and they played Blackburn Rovers. We went out for a nice, really nice bloke. We were just chatting away and uh playing Blackburn and he was, you know, he alerted me to the fact that, you know, he did have a bit of a job on his hands, but you know, he's gonna go there and roll his sleeves up and do as best as he could do. Um and I said to him, I said at the time, I said, mate, you know, you've got no chance of going down because at that time when I've looked at it, the stats were right, okay, so Gareth up for Gareth Ainsworth first track. What were QPR's chances of relegation, um, Lady? Uh, 50%. Less than that, probably 30. Right, I'm gonna, I'm, I, 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 I haven't prepared I, I haven't prepared this one earlier, but I think the chances of QPR being relegated, actually, Laney, it's not even 30%. It was actually, it was actually, and he's, uh, he's, he's, he's uh, doing the stalling game now. He's actually, uh, QPR, QPR, it was, uh, it's like a number 6%. Up. It Six. was no, 7%. Right. Okay. There was 7% chance of being relegated February the 21st Ooh. when he took over. Now, well, he's, done a, he's done a brilliant job then. <laughs> what do you think it is now? Uh, 80? Not quite. It's 42% chance of relegation oh, now. Oh, it will be 80. It will be 80. <laughs> so uh, Blackpool, a 99% chance of relegation, I think it is. Yeah. Um, Wigan are 98% chance of relegation, looks like. And then after that, You've got QPR at 42%, Reading 37%, and Huddersfield at 19%. And it drops massively to Cardiff at 4% after that. So it's kind of three teams are fine for that final relegation. So they're, so they're, the, fav- they're the favourites? Of that they're the favourites of the, of, the, of the three pack at the moment now to get relegated. The so, shit uh, pack. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Excellent. And also Re- Reading, obviously, they got some um, points uh, deducted. So if they didn't have them points deducted, then QPR will be in right lot of trouble at the moment now but like i said to you the west london mini league we're still uh at the top uh, are we still at the top of the west london mini we're league still, we're still top bill and we've got we've got the west london mini league one of we've got a big final aren't we next week we've got chelsea away no that's chelsea right. away yeah that's, that's what i saw um, the play so it's not even a playoff it's just it's just it's what it's a one-off game isn't it it's just well, you know i'm full and full are playing the european champions on this weekend aren't they so Leeds, um, yeah yeah, oh, that's, yeah that's right okay um so yeah, yeah it's this this yeah, it's lots of it's all, all to play for still all to play for so i'll tell you something it's all to play for i'm going to ask you if there's all to play for, what is the score going to be on Saturday? It's going to be a 2-2 draw, Mr Grant. OK. And for me, I'll tell you something, I'm not. I'm almost like at a stage where I'm not going to go for 2-0 because I never seem to get it right. Uh, so I'm actually not going to go for 2-0, which is the hint to Brentford to say, Billy has not gone for 2-0, which means that you know exactly what to do on Saturday just to go, ah, there you go, mate. You know, you should have tucked in. So I'm going to go for 1-0 to the mighty, mighty bees on Saturday. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. Over and done with. Um, This is the Besotted Pride of West London podcast. Subscribe and just vote for us and also write some reviews. And uh, thank you very much for buying us a beer at besotted.com forward slash beer. Uh, We've got besotted.com forward slash global as well. Uh, what else have we got going on, lady? We've got um, we've got all sorts of stuff going on as well. Like I said, we've got people uh, coming over. We've got talk about over. it next week. Talk yeah, we'll talk, we will talk oh, about I've it next week. I've got something else to oh, say. Ladies, went, oh. to, um, went to the London Book Fair yesterday. Oh, and, book um, fair. I was uh, thinking about having all of my back catalogue converted into audio books, but I won't bore you all with the intricacies of that. But yes. I sat down for a meeting with one company, and yes. um, the German CEO said, uh, oh, I, I like your books. These are lovely books. He said... Um, okay. You don't suppose you do any on on my on my football team? I said, Dan, oh, who's your football team? You went, well, my, my my English team is Brentford. Oh, no. I went, oh, I went, oh no. <laughs> I, went, I went, I'm I'm beside. He went, no way, no way. He said, I follow you. I, I said, well, you know, you must listen to me, you know, me and Billy every week. He goes, yeah, I do. So um, yeah, maybe that's a bit of fate there. But Brentford but, everywhere, mate. Brentford, Brentford absolutely. absolutely everywhere so uh, okay so anyway just finishing that off because it's said to you thanks very much for listening everybody we will catch up with you on saturday catch the post-match podcast after the game pride of west dot london subscribe everywhere honestly if you subscribe the podcast comes straight to your phone as well which is all good but like i said to you we got lady in the place 
Good afternoon. My name is Billy Grant in the house. Thank you very much. And tell you something, we'll catch up with you later. We'll have another one. We'll have another one. We'll have another one. You may just get them villains. They're absolute villains, crooks. Don't let them steal the points. Don't let them steal the points. Absolutely not. It's not actually villain, it's villa. Mm. 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 Mm.